unless you have to start on a new page, draw a squiggly line underneath the chapter three words. Now, if all you have space for underneath chapter three is the title, then yes, go to the next page. If you have enough room for the title and like one or two words, stay on that page. Okay, so in little, a little bit larger writing, write the title of these vocab words, which is T, P, T. Chapter four, it's a long title. Confusion in the marketplace. And then write today's date, February 26th. 2021, the last day of February that we will be in school. And then we're going to start with number 12. So you should have TPT, Chapter 4, Confusion in the Marketplace, and then today's date, February 26, 2021. We're going to start with number 12. Number 12 is the word infuriate. Infuriate. I N F U R I A T E. Infuriate. I N F U R I A T E. Infuriate. Infuriate is a verb an action and it means to make someone extremely angry you may have heard your parents say this to you when you're not doing the right thing you infuriate me infuriate I n f u r I, A, T, E is a verb. <clears throat> that means to make someone extremely angry. Number 13 is the word tumult. Or tumult. You may hear it differently. Tumult. T U M U L T. Tumult. T U M U L T. That is a noun. It's a thing. It's not a thing you can hold in your hand. It's a thing that can happen. And what it is, is confusion and chaos. So if you walk into a room and everybody's just like going insane, like they're being really loud and they're running all over the place. Like if you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you would walk in and that room would be in tumult. Confusion and chaos. There's kids running all around. Some are crying, some are yelling, some are laughing. There's all kinds of sounds and noises and smells and things to see. That is what tumult is. If you walk into a room and everybody's just going wild, that room would be in tumult. Yes, Erin? How do you spell chaos? Chaos is spelled C-H-A-O-S. C-H-A-O-S. Last word, number 14 is the word, this is a long one, make sure you're spelling it right, miss apprehension. If you say it all together, it's misapprehension. 
Remember, MIS is a word, is a prefix that tells you you're doing the base word wrong. So apprehension means understanding. So if you have misapprehension, that means you are understanding incorrectly. It is a noun. So it's a thing. It's not a thing you can touch, see, smell, taste, hold. It's a called an abstract noun. It's an idea. And the official definition is not An incorrect understanding. So if we know the base word apprehension means understanding, and we know the uh, prefix MIS means you're doing the thing wrong, that means you are not understanding correctly. Yes? There's what? There is a prefix in our definition. What is it? Incorrect. Well, what's the prefix? In, the I-N on incorrect. Because remember, I-N makes a word the opposite. So if correct means right, incorrect means not right. Okay, make sure you have all those words. Make sure that they are written correctly. Make sure everything is spelled correctly. If you need me to spell a word, please raise your hand and ask me. Lena, do you have, do you, can you see all these? Do you have them spelled correctly so that you can do your vocab cards this weekend? Okay. So, uh, Lena, don't forget you'll need to bring home your vocab notebook and you'll need to use flair. And then I will give you the cards right now. Okay. Go ahead and open to page 45. Make sure you're using your finger to follow along as we read. Make sure your book is not covering your face. I need to be able to see your face so that I can see that you're following along. You might wanna put it flat on your desk, hold it with one hand and use your finger with the other hand. Chapter four, confusion in the marketplace. Indeed it was, for as they approached, Milo could see crowds of people pushing and shouting their way among the stalls, buying and selling, trading and bargaining, Huge wooden wheeled carts streamed into the market square from the orchards and long caravan caravans bound for the four corners of the kingdom made ready to leave. Sacks and boxes were piled high waiting to be delivered to the ships that sailed the sea of knowledge and off to one side, a group of minstrels sang songs to the delight of those either too young or too old to engage in trade. <clears throat> But above all the noise and tumult of the crowd could be heard the merchants' voices loudly advertising their products. Get your fresh, your fresh picked ifs, ands, and buts. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, nice ripe wares and wins. Juicy, tempting words for sale. So many words and so many people. They were from every place imaginable and some places even beyond that and they were all busy sorting, choosing, and stuffing things into cases. As soon as one was filled, another was begun. There seemed to be no end to the bustle and activity. Milo and Talk wandered up and down the aisles, looking at the wonderful assortment of words for sale. There were short ones and easy ones for everyday use, and long and very important ones for special occasions and even some marvelously fancy ones packed in individual gift boxes for use in royal decrees and pronouncements. Step right up, step right up. Fancy best quality words right here, announced one man in a booming voice. Step right up. Ah, what can I do for you, little boy? How about a nice bag full of pronouns? Or maybe you'd like our special assortment of names. Milo had never thought much about words before, but these looked so good that he longed to have some. Look, Tuck, he cried, aren't they beautiful? 
They're fine if you have something to say, replied Top in a tired voice, for he was much more interested in finding a bone than in shopping for new words. Maybe if I buy some, I can learn how to use them, said Milo eagerly, as he began to pick through the words in the stall. Finally, he chose three which looked particularly good to him, quagmire, flabbergast, and upholstery. He had no idea what they meant, but they looked very grand and elegant. How much are these, he inquired. And when the man whispered the answer, he quickly put them back on the shelf and started to walk away. Why not take a few pounds of happies, advised the salesman. They're much more practical and very useful for happy birthday, happy new year, happy days, and happy go lucky. I'd very much, I'd like to very much, began Milo, but, or perhaps you'd be interested in a package of goods. Always handy for good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye, he suggested. Milo did want to buy something, but the only money he had was the coin he needed to get back through the toll booth. And talk, of course, had nothing but the time. Zari, make sure you're sitting up straight, please. No, thank you, replied Milo. We're just looking. And they continued on through the market. As they turned down the last aisle of stalls, Milo noticed a wagon that seemed different from the rest. On its side was a small, neatly lettered sign that said, do it yourself. And inside were 26 bins filled with all the letters of the alphabet from A to Z. These are for people who like to make their own words, the man in charge informed him. You can pick any assortment you like or buy a special box complete with all letters, punctuation marks, and a book of instructions. Here, taste an A, they're very good. Zari, please sit up, back against the chair. Milo nibbled carefully at the, at the letter and discovered that it was quite sweet and delicious, just the way you'd expect an A to taste. I knew you'd like it, laughed the letter man, popping two G's and an R into his mouth and letting the juice drip down his chin. A's are one of our most popular letters. All of them aren't that good, he confided in a low voice. Take the Z, for example, for instance. Very dry and sawdusty. And the X? Why, it tastes like a trunk full of stale air. That's why people hardly ever use them. But most of the others are quite tasty. Try some more. He gave Milo an I, which was icy and refreshing, and talk a crisp, crunchy C. Most people are just too lazy to make their own words, he continued, but it's much more fun. Is it difficult? I'm not much good at making words, admitted Milo, spitting the pits from a pea. Perhaps I can be of some assistance, A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, buzzed an unfamiliar voice. And when Milo looked up, he saw an enormous bee, at least twice his, at least twice his size, sitting on top of the wagon. I am the spelling bee, announced the spelling bee. Don't be alarmed, A-L-A-R-M-E-D. Talk ducked under the wagon, and Milo, who was not overly fond of normal-sized bees, began to back away slowly. I can spell anything, A-N-Y-T-H-I-N-G, he boasted, testing his wings. Try me, try me. Can you spell goodbye? Suggested Milo as he continued to back away. The bee gently lifted himself into the air and circled lazily over Milo's head. Perhaps, P-E-R-H-A-P-S, you are under the misapprehension, M-I-S-A-P-P-R-E-H-E-N-S-I-O-N, that I am dangerous, he said, turning a smart loop to the left. Let me assure, A-S-S-U-R-E, you, that my intentions are peaceful, P-E-A-C-E-F-U-L. And with that, he settled back on top of the wagon and fanned himself with one wing. Now, he panted, think of the most difficult word you can and I'll spell it. Hurry up, hurry up. And he jumped up and down impatiently. He looks friendly enough, thought Milo, not just sure, not, ooh, 
excuse me, not sure just how friendly a friendly bumblebee should be, and tried to think of a very difficult word. Spell vegetable, he suggested, for it was one that always troubled him at school. That is a difficult one, said the bee, winking at the letter man. Let me see now. Hmm. He frowned and wiped his brow and paced slowly back and forth on top of the wagon. How much time do I have? Just 10 seconds, cried Milo excitedly. Count them off, talk. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, the bee repeated, continuing to pace nervously. Then, just as the time ran out, he spelled as fast as he could, V-E-G-E-T-A-B-L-E. -E -E. Correct, shouted the letter man, and everyone cheered. Can you spell everything? Asked Milo admiringly. Just about, replied the bee with a hint of pride in his voice. You see, years ago, I was just an ordinary bee, minding my own business, smelling flowers all day, and occasionally picking up part-time work in people's bonnets. Then, one day, I realized that I'd never amount to anything without an education, and being naturally adept at spelling, I decided that balderdash, shouted a booming voice. And from around the wagon stepped a large beetle-like insect dressed in a lavish coat, striped pants, checked vest, spats, and a derby hat. Let me repeat, balderdash, he shouted again, swinging his cane and clicking his heels in midair. Come now, don't be ill-mannered. Wait, sorry. Come now, don't be ill-mannered. Isn't someone going to introduce me to the little boy? This, said the bee with a complete disdain, is the humbug, a very dislikable fellow. Nonsense! Everyone loves a humbug, shouted the humbug. As I was saying to the king just the other day, you've never met the king, accused the bee angrily. Then, turning to Milo, he said, don't believe a thing this old fraud says. Bosh, replied the humbug. We're an old and noble family, honorable to the core. Insecticus humbugium, if I may use the Latin. Why, we fought in the Crusades with Richard the Lionheart, crossed the Atlantic with Columbus, blazed trails with the pioneers, and today many members of the family hold prominent government positions throughout the world. History is full of humbugs. A very pretty speech, S-P-E-E-C-H, sneered the bee. Now, why don't you go away? I was just advising the lad of the importance of proper spelling. Bah, said the bug, putting an arm around Milo. As soon as you learn to spell one word, they ask you to spell another. You can never catch up, so why bother? Take my advice, my boy, and forget about it. As my great-great-grandfather, George Washington Humbug, used to say, You, sir, shouted the bee very excitedly, are an imposter. I-M-P-O-S-T-O-R, who can't even spell his own name. A slavish concern for the composition of words is the sign of a bankrupt belief, oh, intellect, sorry, roared the humbug, waving his cane furiously. Milo didn't have any idea what this meant, but it seemed to infuriate the spelling bee, who flew down and knocked off the humbug's hat with his wing. Be careful shouted Milo as the bug swung his cane again, catching the bee on the foot and knocking over a box of W's. My foot, shouted the bee. My hat, shouted the bug, and the fight was on. The spelling bee buzzed dangerously in and out of range of the humbug's wildly swinging cane as they, men as they menaced and threatened each other, and the crowd stepped back out of danger. There must be some way to began Milo, and then he yelled, watch out, but it was too late. There was a tremendous crash, and as the humbug, in his great fury, tripped into one of the stalls, knocking it into another, then another, then another, then another, until every stall in the marketplace had been upset, and the words lay scrambled in great confusion all over the square. The bee, who had tangled himself in some bunting, toppled to the ground, knocking Milo over on top of him, and lay there shouting, Help! Help! There's a little boy on me! The bug sprawled untidily on a mound of squashed letters 
and talk, his alarm ringing persistently, was buried under a pile of words. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and work on the journals. So whose journal is on the top? Mason, I think yours is on the top over here. So Mason, go ahead. Tell us, Victoria, is yours on the top of the other? Okay, Victoria, go get yours. Mason, tell whoever's underneath yours to go next. Victoria, tell whoever's underneath yours to go and next. Explain how to do number five one more time, both for the video and for those of you that may not quite understand yet and are too afraid to tell me for some reason. If you choose to num do number five, you start by writing the number five and then put these events in the order they happen. But instead of copying it exactly as it appears like we normally do, you just write the events in the correct order. There's five events. The first order, first event, you're gonna write first. The second event, you're gonna write second. The third event, you're gonna write third. The fourth event, you're gonna write fourth. The fifth event, you're gonna write fifth. So you will not write these twice, just once in the correct order. Does everybody understand that? Number six, if you bought the letters K, P, R, O, T, S, Q, U, E, and A at the do-it-yourself stall, what words could you make? No, you've only bought one of each of these, so you can't repeat any letters. You also can't make words with letters that are not here. Does everybody understand how to do number six? Victoria. So, um, can you make all the words that you As many as you can think of. Do that. If you'd want to do this, don't do it first. You can do it second, third, fourth, whatever. Okay? Yes, Zadie, quickly. So if we make one word with, say, P, R, and O, we can't use those? You can words? use them again. You just can't use them twice in the same word. Like, you couldn't do apple because, well, you only have one P. Apple is spelled A-P-P-L-E. Well, you have an A, but you only have one P, and you have no L, you do have an E. So, but you can't do, okay, well, let's see. What's a word? that has, let's see, poor, like poor, like somebody is poor. It's spelled P-O-O-R. Well, you have P-O and R, but you only have one O. So you can't do poor. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? Victoria, quickly. Can't, so if you, if you have a lot of words that you can make on one of them, is it okay if you have some on Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 You're just, don't do that one first. You can do it second or third, or you should not get to a fourth. Okay, so remember, pick a question. You do not have to go in order. Pick the question that you know you can give the best answer to first. Then pick the question you think you can give the second best answer to, second, and so on. You will have 15 minutes. 15 minutes to write at least one and a half to two really good, very well thought out answers. Well written, lots of thought put into it. You are not answering all six. Does everybody understand? Nobody should be able to answer all six in 15 minutes. If you do, it's because you are putting zero thought into the questions you're answering. Yes, Ethan, quickly. No, you do not have to do them in order. If you want to do number four first, go ahead and do number four first. Just please don't do number six first because that may take the longest. And I want you to answer at least two. But that doesn't mean, I, I hate saying at least two because then some of you think, oh, I'm done with two. Even though I'm pretty sure I still have like five minutes left, I'm gonna stop here. That's not okay. I can tell when people do that because I know what each of you are capable of at this point. So don't just stop at two because I said at least two. If you are finished with two and there is still time left, the timer has not gone off, do another one. There's a reason I don't tell you how much time is left because I can guarantee you if I said, okay, there's two minutes left, some of you would just stop and pretend to write for the last two minutes. 
That's why I don't tell you how much time is left. Okay, any questions about the questions? Zadie, quickly. Um, for number four, didn't Milo not buy them because he only had Yeah, I, um, he, he looked at three words. He didn't buy them when I um, wrote this a while back. I have to, this is falling apart. All the pages are falling out, so I've changed it on what I'm going to start using next year. Okay. Remember, write the question with the number. Some of you are leaving off the number, and that gets really confusing for me. Write the number. Like, if you choose to do number three first, write three. Write, choose two adjectives to describe the humbug. Explain why you chose them. Skip one or two lines. Please don't skip more than two because you're gonna run out of space. Skip one or two lines, write your answer, at least two complete sentences. Again, I hate saying at least, because a lot of you are like, I have two sentences, I'm done. And then I check it and it's barely answered, and then you get a 50 on the assignment, and some of you know that's true because it's happened to you. Don't stop at two just because I say at least two. At least two means two or more. A lot of these require more than two sentences. Then when you're done, skip one or two lines and then say you choose to do number one next. Then you're gonna write number one, describe some items that are being sold in the market, which would you wanna buy, why? Skip one or two lines, write that answer and so on. Any questions? Go ahead and open your journals back up. When I say go, you will have 15 minutes. Do not stop writing or thinking. Make sure you are staying on, your thoughts are staying on topic, not straying. You're thinking about the questions and Phantom Tollbooth, and you're writing for 15 whole minutes, nonstop. You may use your book, but try to use your book as little as possible. You may use it though. If you have a question, you may come and ask me. Please come to my desk and ask me because I'm going to be grading. Um, yes. Okay, don't start yet. I haven't said go yet. Go.